All right, guys, thanks for coming out. Welcome to Ore Deposit Hub, the uh, Wednesday geology double dip that currently replaces conference trips. Uh, that's that's not a real slogan. I just thought of it in the shower and thought it sounded kind of cool. But uh, I want to introduce our speaker today, which is uh, distinguished professor Ross Large. So many of you probably heard of or know of Ross. He did his bachelor's at the University of Tasmania, did a PhD at the University of New England. He then had a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. Good job, Ross. And then he went back to the University of Tasmania, and I think a lot of you have heard of codes and know about codes. He's helped establish that. And Ross is internationally renowned for working with uh, global mining companies, studying ore deposit geology. He likes to determine geological and geochemical factors that are the controls on the genesis of stratiform sediment, volcanic hosted deposits, both base metal and gold, as well as probably um, many other deposit types. Uh, but now he's turned his geological prowess towards studying uh, the chemistry of past oceans and not only how this can affect ore deposits, but also how it developed uh, marine life and the evolution of all life and nutrient cycling. Um, today, uh, well, you can look at his talk title today, it's to do with uh, atmospheric oxygen and how that can relate to ore deposits. So I think this is a conglomerate of lots of work from him and his students at CODES. And uh, we're really happy to have you here, Ross. Thanks for agreeing to do this. And when you're ready, you can go ahead. Thanks very much, Chris. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I only just heard about your hub uh, a few weeks ago, so it's great to see that you've set this up in such short time, and it's a great thing to have while we were in this uh, period of COVID-19. But uh, I, I agree with the concept that you're going to continue it going because um, I think there'll be a lot of changes now after the... Uh, after we get rid of the virus and, and this will be a very good one. So uh, it's great to be here and welcome to those who are sitting and listening in. I can't see you all, but uh, I can imagine that, um, or I hope that you'll be able to enjoy what I'm going to be talking about. So Precambrian atmosphere, oxygen and all deposits. This is a, a photograph of some uh, beautiful ore from the Zambian copper belt that I took on a trip with Codes and um, Murray Hitzman and uh, some of the Colorado School of Mines people. Beautiful ore, as you can see there, within black shales. So the contents of this talk is I'll start off by talking about ore deposit cycles and move on to the archive of sedimentary pyrite and how we've been using sedimentary pyrite to develop a new approach to predicting atmosphere oxygen and then talk about the Archean deposits briefly and their relationship to oxygen, and, but spend more time on the sediment hosted deposits such as the copper, cobalt, silver deposits and the sediment hosted lead, zinc, silver, and wrap up with trying to convince you that oxygen in the atmosphere is very important in developing these cycles of ore deposits. And it has major implications for exploration. So this diagram put together by Groves and Bailey um, hasn't changed much since they developed it. And just showing you the timing going from uh, 4,000 4, MA at the bottom. So that's in the very early Archean right through to the present. Um, and showing you how the deposits vary in their position with time. So in the Archean, we've got sediment hosted gold, the big water conditions in the Archean, and we've got a significant portion of the HMS deposits. And we've got some of the big sedimentary copper deposits at the start of that period and at the end of that period we've got the major ICGs and we've got sedimentary uranium. So quite a distinct group, grouping of deposits in the Proterozoic that are very different to what we see in the Archean. And then when we get to the Phanerozoic, we've got all those deposits. So we've got the ones that are in the Archean are repeated in the Phanerozoic, and we've got the ones that are in the Proterozoic repeated in the Phanerozoic. And that's a real dilemma of why we're seeing that, that happening. So the sort of questions I'd like to address are, 
Why are there so few gold and massive sulfides and biffs in the middle Proterozoic? Whereas we've got sedimentary uranium and sedimentary copper and ISCGs that are abundant in the Proterozoic. And why are SEDEX abundant in the Prot? Whereas MVTs are rare, they're both lead zinc systems. Uh, and why are all these deposits present in the Phanerozoic? I'll only touch on the Phanerozoic because I'll spend most of my time in the Precambrian. So our approach has been to use the trace element concentrations in sedimentary pyrite to track the chemistry of the ocean atmosphere system through time. And then to see how that relates to the ore deposits. Now, the, the quality of pyrite, the unique quality of pyrite that we use in this study is that sedimentary pyrite absorbs a range of trace elements. Hydrothermal pyrite does also, but in this case, we're looking at pyrite in sedimentary rocks. And we've got a whole range of trace elements that substitute for iron in the iron site of sulfur. And we've got another group of trace elements that substitute for sulfur. And also many of these trace elements occur as micro inclusions in the pyrite, as actually inclusions micro-inclusions of sphalerite or galena or chalcopyrite that probably came out of the structure of the pyrite as it was aged. Now, we had a technology breakthrough about um, 10 to 15 years ago, and that's the development of the laser ablation ICPMS system, because that allows us to analyse to very low levels the quantities of trace elements in sulphide minerals. And we have a mapping facility now where we can map out a, a pyrite like this one shown here, which is an early diagenetic pyrite surrounded by a later metamorphic overgrowth. And we can look at all the trace elements and their distribution in those zones in the pyrite. So it's giving us a beautiful parogenesis of how the pyrite evolves and how the chemistry evolves. Now in diagenetic pyrites, we don't see a lot of this, because they they don't have overgrowth and zonation. They're fairly consistent. In hydrothermal and metamorphic pyrites, we see this beautiful zonation and change. The sort of pyrites we concentrate in, in black shale, so we're looking at pyrite growing in anoxic and eucinic sediments. The blackest of black shales are what we're looking for all the time. And they can be framboidal types of pyrites, uh, like the top ones up here. They can be microcrystalline types of pyrite, very small crystals dotted through the shale. They can be nodular, these sort of uh, amorphous, uh, cloudy type of nodules, or they can be more compact nodules. What we don't analyze are uh, pyrites like these at the bottom that have a cubic outline and are most likely light diagenetic to metamorphic in their origin. This cluster you can see here is growing around an original diagenetic pyrite, and that's a laser hole in that. It's about um, 40 microns across. That's the normal size of the laser that we use to analyze pyrite. Now, if we analyzed a pyrite like this, you might say, well, there's a hell of a lot of pores and, and matrix in that pyrite. Well, that's true, and we've developed computer program that allows us to extract out the uh, matrix material from the pyrite and get a fairly pure analysis. It means that we've got to analyze the pyrite with several spots, and then we've got to analyze the matrix with several spots. Now, the sort of samples we're taking, as I said, are from very uh, organic rich muds that deposit on the sea floor. Um, we usually uh, sample from drill core. I'm just showing you this uh, on the south coast of uh, the UK and the, the Jurassic, um, which is a really nice exposure. In Australia, these exposures are very weathered and not suitable for sampling, and we use drill core all the time. So 90% of our samples are from drill core because we need to get below the depth of weathering that causes havoc with the chemistry of of pyrite and shales. So we've got samples from all around the world, been uh, contributed by many of our colleagues. 
and we've sampled a lot around Australia and elsewhere ourselves. We've now got over 6,000 pyrite analyses from about 220 different formations that are spread from about 3.6 GA right through to the current time. And that allows us to plot all that data up and um, look at how the composition of the pyrite varies through time. So these are a couple of graphs just showing you the nickel variation. And you can see that at any given time, there's quite a big variation, like let's say here at about 2800 MA, you see a lot of variation in the amount of nickel in pyrite. Now, some of that is natural variation in a given sample. Uh, some of it is due to the fact that we've got several samples here from different locations that are showing quite a variation. We're looking more at the maximum or the mean values. And here I've put a line through the maximum, uh, but most of the time we deal with mean values um, to overcome this, uh, the fact that the pyrites can be quite variable in their composition. But you can see, for instance, that in the Archean, there was uh, quite a few peaks of nickel in our pyrite. We go through the Proterozoic where there's less nickel and you'll see a, there's a scale change here. I'm sorry it's not shown on this graph, but as we go into the past 800 MA, we increase the scale so you can see a lot more variability going through the Phanerozoic in particular, as you can see there. Gold uh, shows uh, several peaks in the Archean, uh, fairly flat through the Proterozoic and shows peaks again in the um, Phanerozoic. Now, we had to develop a, a proof of concept to demonstrate that what we're analysing in the pyrite is a representation of how the ocean chemistry has changed through time. And that has been done by uh, Dan Gregory, one of our PhD students who's now at the University of Toronto. He analysed pyrite from the Cariaco Basin. And um, here we're comparing the amount of trace elements in the pyrite with the amount of trace elements in modern seawater, because these pyrites are forming today in anoxic muds in the Cariaco Basin. And you can see a correlation here. The nutrient, what we call the nutrient trace elements, cluster together uh, on this line, and the scavenge trace elements uh, below that. Now, the nutrient, we call the nutrient elements those that have a, a moderate uh, residence time in the ocean, but they're important for life in the ocean. The concentration factor between the pyrite, uh, the, yeah, the trace element in the pyrite and the trace element in the ocean, you get this nice relationship where the nutrient elements all cluster together, the scavenged elements cluster together, and the one element that's what we call conservative could be abundant. So if we can draw up these time series of trace elements from right from the early Archean right through to the present. You can see selenium here, molybdenum and cobalt. And the thing that strikes you straight away is the variation we're measuring in these elements through time. And that's particularly obvious in the Phanerozoic where you can see the curves going up and down. And the, Scale here, you mightn't be able to read too well, but we're looking at three to four orders of magnitude change in the amount of selenium in pyrite. Generally, selenium increases through time, as does molybdenum, whereas cobalt decreases through time. Nickel's the same, it decreases um, through time. Um, and that's related to the fact that these are redox sensitive elements. They're they change in concentration depending on the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And we published that in Earth and Planetary Sciences uh, back in 2014. Now, why are we measuring these? What is the real interest in the chemistry of the ocean? Well, it's important in the nutrient elements or the, the elements that are essential for life, such as iron, nickel, cobalt, molybdenum, selenium, manganese, copper, zinc, vanadium, they're all essential for life, those elements. And so we want to understand how they've changed and how that might have affected life in the ocean. And we've just had a paper accepted in geology 
which went online this, this week actually um, from one of my uh, postdoctoral students who, who um, has looked at how that variation is occurring and what it means. But more importantly, in this context, we want to be able to see if the chemistry of the ocean tells us anything about the oxygen in the atmosphere. And we published our latest work on that in pre-Cambrian research earlier this year. There's also a possibility of uh, determining proxies for acidity or pH in the ocean, but this is something we haven't really developed at this stage. This is uh, what we call our pre-Cambrian nutrient matrix, and this was published in Geology, um, just showing you how elements are varied through time. These are the elements here, these are the uh, ages, and this is a, a ratio of the amount of element over the average for the whole of time in the ocean. So you can see the color, blue color means very low, green is a little higher, orange is higher still and red is very high. So you can see in the um, Archean, we had pretty high numbers for nickel and cobalt and copper uh, and iron and chromium. And that's pretty natural really, because those elements are going to be abundant in the mafic rocks in the Cromartyites and they're being eroded into the ocean to contribute to those high elements. But they all fade away as we approach the Proterozoic and the other elements become abundant. Um, copper stays up to this point and then drops away. Molybdenum suddenly appears at about 1800, as does potassium. And that's associated with a lot of anorogenic intrusions that are enriched in potassium and molybdenum that are then being eroded and contributing to the ocean. But the surprising thing about that middle Proterozoic period is that generally it was very nutrient poor. All these other elements have gone right down except for molybdenum and potassium. But then we can see as we go, approach the end of the Proterozoic and go into the Phanerozoic, the elements rise up again, particularly at the um, boundary of the Phanerozoic and the Cambrian. Now I wanna concentrate here on selenium. We picked selenium for two reasons. One is that it's very redox sensitive. So it's a good proxy for the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And also it's very uniform in pyrite. Um, it doesn't get zoned um, and, it, it, and it's stable even under metamorphism. So it's a very good element for us to analyze. Um, and if we look at selenium through time, um, it's been fairly low through the Archean and Proterozoic, but really jumps up at the boundary of the Cambrian and, and, and has an oscillating or, or cyclic nature um, through, the, through the Phanerozoic. And when selenium gets very low, these low points correspond to mass extinction events. And we published this several years ago. This is the uh, late Ordovician mass extinction. These are the Devonian mass extinctions. These are the Triassic, Jurassic mass extinction, and then the, the KT mass extinction. The Permian one doesn't stand out that well, uh, probably because it's due to other factors such as volcanic eruptions, etc. But that points out that also there was a mass extinction around about 600 MA, uh, which fits with the paleontological evidence also. But we're looking at selenium because we're trying to track oxygen in the atmosphere. And selenium is very much like sulfur. Um, so sulfur becomes more abundant in the ocean as oxygen goes up, as does selenium. Selenium is a little different though, and it has two oxidized species, a selenate and a selenite species. And that makes it even more useful to track oxygenation. As oxygen goes up, we break down pyrite and other sulfides on the continents, the, the selenate and selenite species under an oxygenated atmosphere are mobile and move into the ocean. They have a residence time about 26,000 years. Eventually they precipitate out and go into pyrite because that's the natural um, mineral that takes up the selenium. And that's what we measure the pyrite. So Variations in selenium content in pyrite can tell us when oxygen went up and oxygen went down. We use cobalt also because it's the reverse of selenium. 
where when oxygen goes up, selenium goes up, but cobalt goes down. And you can see that really well in this set of data uh, through the Devonian and Carboniferous, where we've got a really good data set from various localities around the world. And you can see in the early Devonian, selenium rose to the mid Devonian, whereas cobalt dropped. And then selenium dropped going into the Carboniferous, whereas cobalt rose. So we're seeing opposites there, and that, that's chemically understood. It's well known by the chemists um, that cobalt, when it oxidizes, actually gets trapped by iron and manganese oxides and, and doesn't and becomes immobile, whereas selenium becomes very mobile. So we've developed a proxy, the selenium cobalt ratio. And here the selenium cobalt ratio is plotted. And um, that varies. It's a really good proxy for oxygenation because it has such a big, big variation. And that's what you're looking for in a proxy, a big wide variation. So oxygen's going up to a peak in the mid Devonian, it's dropping down into the Carboniferous, and then it's rising again um, in the late Carboniferous. Now the problem was when we published that, we didn't, we hadn't quantified it. We, we're just saying it goes up and down. But we joined forces with a group in Canada led by Nigel Blaney from the University of Western Ontario. And he's been measuring the oxygen in gases in fluid inclusions in marine halite. Whereas we're measuring selenium cobalt ratio in marine pyrite. So it's a, it's a similar process, two totally different minerals. And we've used his data to plug into our data to then get a relationship between the two and between the measurements of oxygen that he's making. And that relationship is pretty robust, amazingly. Uh, he hasn't got a lot of good measurements because it's far more difficult to measure oxygen in gases in fluid inclusions than it is to measure uh, pyrite composition. Um, but from the, the, you can see six data points there. Um, we get a pretty good relationship with an R squared of 0.85. It's a fairly complex relation, you can see there. Um, but that allows us to actually calculate oxygen in the atmosphere. And so that's our graph of oxygen in the atmosphere based on about 6,000 pyrites. Now, it's very different to what's currently accepted. So people look at this and say, oh, gee, that's crazy. It just doesn't make sense. What our data is telling us is oxygen was, was pretty low in the Archean, as most people would say, less than 1%. But it, it rose from about 2,900 uh, fairly steeply uh, through 2,400 and ended up peaking at about 2,000, 2,000 to 1,800. Then it dropped. Uh, had a little peak at about 1400 and then dropped down again. Those stars there are the measurements of Nigel Blaney's that we've plugged into the equation. So you can see that they're pretty good and that's because the R squared is very good. They're sitting right on our curve. Now, this has created a major controversy amongst those that are interested in oxygen in the atmosphere because the current uh, paradigm uh, of Tim Lyons and others that work in this area is that it was very low in the Archean and continually low in the Proterozoic between 0.02 and 0.28% oxygen. And that's been argued that that's the reason that life didn't take off in the, um, <clears throat> on the earth because there's insufficient oxygen through the Proterozoic. We're saying it was much higher in the Proterozoic, peaking at around 1800 MA, it went up to about 15 weight percent, which is not too different to what it is today. And we'd argue that that's been a critical factor in the ore deposit evolution in particular. <clears throat> so that's the difference between the models that are available now. Our model we published in, um, one of my other postdocs, uh, Jeff Stedman, was the lead on a publication in Pre-Cambrian Research. And basically our story is that oxygen rises continually from about 2800 right through to 1800, and then it drops going through the rest of the Proterozoic until it rises dramatically at the Cambrian boundary. 
And that's very different to the accepted idea that it was very low in the Archean, it rose and then dropped in through the Phanerozoic, uh, sorry, the Proterozoic, and then rose again at the end. These are on different scales, so it's different. It's difficult to compare them actually. But we say oxygen peaked at about 15% in the, um, at 1800, whereas the peak here is 10 to the minus two of PAL, which is about 0.2%. So there's a big difference, 0.2 as opposed to 15. Now we've compared our proxy with other proxies. Uranium is commonly used as a proxy for oxygen. And we've measured uranium in all our samples. And you can see that the curves are fairly similar and the peak is in the same place. The other proxy that's been used is um, Condi um, measured the thickness of black shales through time and published this in 2000. And he concluded that the maximum black shale deposition was between 2000 and about 1700. And that's where we see maximum oxygen. And that's logical because the burial of carbon is what drives oxygen in the atmosphere. And thirdly, we've compared our data with um, Bob Hazen's mineral evolution curves. And these are available on the web. They're really interesting curves. Um, and he's shown that uh, there were periods, there were bursts of new minerals being generated on earth. And the first burst was um, around about 2,700. You can see peaking here and that correlates with our rise that we've measured. But the second peak, that really big peak was um, at about 1,800. And, and that's because oxygen going up leads to the evolution of new minerals, new oxygenated or, or high valence minerals um, that haven't been seen on earth before in greater abundance. So let's look at the Archean ore deposits now. We've got a handle on the oxygen um, and they're the sediment hosted norogenic gold, the VHMS deposits and the banded iron formations. So we can see there on that graph that they're abundant in the Archean, but they're not very abundant at all in the Proterozoic. Now, this depends on us appreciating that, that most of these basin hosted ore deposits I'm talking about form from upper crustal fluids. They either form from seawater that circulates down into the crust, conate or sedimentary brines that are coming out of the sedimentary basins, meteoric water plays a role in some cases, and diagenetic and shallow metamorphic waters. We're dealing with the, the top of the crust. We're not going very deep in these, these basins, although some of them are tens of kilometers deep, but we're dealing with surficial waters mainly. And we have a, an equilibrium in these waters between the, the waters that are controlled by oxygen in the atmosphere, but also being buffered by the rocks as they move through the rocks and particularly the iron two and the iron three. So if we take some examples like the Archean ore deposits, the gold deposits, uh, everyone accepts who looks at these deposits and studies their fluid inclusions that the ore fluid was reduced. It had much more H2S than sulfate it was up to about 350 degrees CO2 bearing low salinity, a reduced fluid. There's very few examples. I'm not familiar of any with any where anyone suggested that the fluid was, was oxidized that formed these deposits. VM, VMS deposits in the Archean also form from reduced fluids, H2S dominant over sulfate. That's again, very well accepted. If we go to the BIF model, it's an interesting one in that we need to convert iron two to iron three in the formation of banded iron formations because they're made up of magnetite, which contains both iron two and iron three, and some are made of hematite, which is only iron three. But in the Archean, they're magnetite BIFs. And that means we need to generate a source of iron two in the oceans. The oceans have to be reduced to be able to develop that source of iron two because iron three is unstable and precipitates. But in, to form the, 
the BIFs, we have to convert some of that iron two to iron three. So we need oxygen to do that. So the BIFs are telling us we're having an oxygenation event, but they're also telling us that broadly the ocean is reduced in order to accumulate enough iron in the ocean. So that's the story for the Archean, reduced fluids on the whole, fitting with a low oxygen atmosphere. If we move to the Proterozoic now and look at our lead zinc deposits and our copper deposits, we'll, we'll look at the models for these and try and understand why they became abundant in the Proterozoic. So sediment hosted copper cobalt deposits, the, the features of those that Murray Hitzman and Dave Selley and others have emphasized for some time is that we need a highly oxidized ore fluid that equilibrates with hematite in the foot wall to carry the copper. So the red beds in the stratigraphic foot wall are very important. Now they're telling us of an oxygenated atmosphere. We can't form red beds without significant oxygen in the atmosphere. We need sulfate evaporites, commonly in the stratigraphic hang wall to facilitate a high salinity. Evaporites are telling us again, oxygenated atmosphere. And we need an organic rich shale or mobile hydrocarbons to act as a reductant to promote the copper sulfides. Now that's a reduced shale, but most reduced shales, black muds on the sea floor, form from dead um, bacteria, from, from life. And to have life in the ocean, we need significant oxygen. So again, we've got a relationship there. Now, how does that relate to the transport of copper, lead and zinc? Well, on this old graph from many years ago, it's a plot of oxygen on the x-axis against the amount of metal dissolved in a fluid. This is for 250 degrees, but you get the same sort of relationship for any temperature from zero to 300 degrees. And that's showing that copper dramatically, well, they all do, they all rise up when they get to the pyrite hematite boundary. So copper is not very soluble in a reduced fluid, but immediately becomes abundant in an oxidized fluid. Lead less so and zinc even, even less. So all these metals like oxygenated fluids, but copper in particular likes a very oxygenated fluid. Now, if we look at the introduction of evaporites through time, that's the next important link in the chain. And I've just drawn up these graphs that come from a database, which is a really useful database that Bob Hazen's group has put together on the occurrence of minerals through time. And so this is a very good way of looking at evaporite occurrence because we can look at the major minerals that occur in evaporites and hydrite, for instance. And we can see there that they started developing around 27 to 2800. Oops, sorry that they rose again between 15 and 1950, and then were fairly low through the Neoprote until about 600 MA when they took off into the Phanerozoic. If we look at Halite, another member of the Evaporite family, the same story, appeared around 27, 28, became abundant in the range of 1450 to 2160, and then took off um, in the Neoproterozoic. If we look at Keserite, another sulfate mineral, same thing, two peaks in the pre Cambrian at the same place, and then it was quite a while before they became abundant in the Phanerozoic. And then the last one, Silvite, is showing the same story. So we take the four most abundant minerals in Evaporite, they all show the same picture, that Evaporites, although they, they were minor Evaporites back in the Archean, it wasn't until the, the um, Proterozoic, the early prote, that they became more abundant and then very significant in the, in the uh, Phanerozoic. But you'll notice there's a big gap between about 1500 and 750 or 800. There's no evaporites to speak of. There's a few, but very limited compared to the other period. So that, my interpretation there is that's just um, telling us about oxygen in the atmosphere and erosion of sulphur into the ocean, as I was talking about selenium. So the model that's been put up 
um, for these sediment hosted copper that came out of studies that Codes and, and um, Colorado School of Mines did several years ago, is that these oxidized fluids are coming up through the red bed conglomerates and sandstones, they're carrying the copper with them because they're so oxidized and they come up to a, a pinch out point, um, interact with black shales. But the key thing is there's an evaporite seal over the top. And that evaporite seal supplies the salinity and the sulfur in these brines as they penetrate down into the basin and even into the basement and then rise up again, transporting the copper and cobalt. So again, a very oxidized fluid. Now, if we go to our curve for oxygen, where do we find the big sedimentary copper deposits? Well, we find them at the peaks of oxygen. We don't find any, hardly, right through the Archean. There wasn't enough sulfate in the ocean and there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere. But as soon as we get a big peak in oxygen, bang, we get a big sedimentary copper deposit like Utakam. And then the next, the Central African copper belt, of course, the monster, is coming in at about 800 or so, and that's where the big rise in oxygen is occurring again. And even though it may have been remobilized several times up to about 500 MA, that was under a very oxygenated atmosphere, as you can see, with all this big steep rise in, in oxygen occurring through this period here. Now let's move to the SEDEX lead zinc silver model. The key elements of that model is that we don't need a highly oxidized brine. We can have a mildly oxidized brine or it can even be mildly reduced, but it's generally equilibrated with hematite and pyrite deep in the basin. There need to be volcanic rocks in the, in the foot wall to supply the metals. And we need to have regional sin sedimentary folding to drive fluids up to the surface because here we're dealing with fluids that come right up into the basin and again we need a thick black shale representing an oxid basin so there's some similar elements but some very different ones so our mildly oxygenated or reduced fluid we need evaporites up here they're on the on the shelf driving fluids down moving around and depositing the, getting the lead zinc from deep in the basin, depositing either just below the sea floor or, or on the sea floor. So again, an oxygenated system, but not as oxygenated as, as before. And when you plot the big lead zinc deposits around the world in the Proterozoic, they're all forming when oxygen is falling down into this trough. It's not going too low. It's between about 5 and 10, 10% based on, on our... Um, calculations, but Rampura, Gucha and Hamsburg, Mount Isa, HYC, Century, Sullivan, they're all down here in the trough compared with the sedimentary copper sitting up here at the peak or over here at the peak. So where, where are we going to find lead zinc? Well, we're going to find it in that interval, but let's go over here. Have we got any lead zinc deposits around about What's that about a thousand MA? Not any significant ones, but maybe it's worth having a look at those rocks of that age. Now, just to move into the Phanerozoic briefly, we've got both of these types sediment hosted lead zinc and sediment hosted copper. And we've got our curve, which is far more um, active in the Phanerozoic. It's going up and down all over the place. Now, a lot of people think this is crazy and don't believe it at all. But the data is telling us that oxygen is varying from about 5% to over 30% through time. And that it's peaking um, here in, at about 400 MA or so. But there's several peaks you can see through there based on our data. <clears throat> now, we've got some big copper deposits. These are the remobilized Central African copper belts at about 550 and we've got the Cooper Schiefer coming in on the close to the Permian Triassic boundary. On the highs, and where are the lead zinc deposits? Oh, we've got Dushekistan also on another high there. Where are the lead zinc deposits? They're all on the lows. 
It's amazing how, how it works out. Absolutely amazing. The lead zinc deposits are down where the mass extinction is occurring. The later would emission mass extinction in here, the, um, the Devonian mass extinctions, the Triassic, Jurassic mass extinction. They're sitting with the mass extinctions. If we expand that out now and, and look at that in more detail, um, you can actually see the detail of uh, several deposits in, in um, Canada sitting here, one in South America, Howards Pass again in, in Canada, Ramelsburg, Megan and Cirque sitting here at 370, the, the, the Irish deposit sitting down here at about 340, and even Red Dog is the last of them before oxygen takes off. So it's pretty amazing, that correlation. Oop. What have I run out of time, have I? No. No. I was covering up. So the take home message now is that oxygen levels have a major influence on the style of basin hosting deposits. That the Archean gold and biffs formed from a reduced ore fluid under an oxygen deficient atmosphere and a sulfate deficient ocean. That the sedimentary deposits, especially the copper deposits, formed at times when evaporites are abundant and oxygen was abundant, whereas the sedimentary lead zincs also need evaporites, but much less oxygen in the atmosphere, periods when oxygen was dropping. The exploration message is that we can take our new graph now and we can colour it according to periods when we should be getting, if you believe this story, of course, we should be getting major copper deposits or zinc deposits. So you can see the period um, between 1800 and 2000 is a copper period, the period between uh, 1700 and 1500 is a zinc period. We've got potential for a copper period around 1400, a zinc period around 1000, a copper period from 800 onwards. And then when we go into the Phanerozoic, you can see because it's going up and down so abundantly, we've got these uh, potential times for copper and lead zinc. There's a few publications you might like to read if you want to follow up this talk. Um, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at those. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the team that works with me um, Dan Gregory, a PhD student who started off on this, this um, role and uh, is now at University of Toronto doing a great job. Indrani Mukherjee, who's now a postdoc with me. Jeff Stedman, also a postdoc. Leonard Danieszczewski, who runs our laboratory for the laser work and is doing a fantastic job. So thank you very much. And uh, I understand that I can take questions.